Just a few facts on JFK. First, during the Eisenhower administration, the CIA pretty much had free reign, and Nixon was the VP for eight years of the CIA's first 11. The whole stage was set for him to become president. Unfortunately for him, Kennedy beat him by a very slim margin. The CIA was inciting coups in Guatemala in 54 and Iran, I believe. One of them was everything was all set up for Nixon to come in and, of course, invade Cuba. When Kennedy called him for advice, that's what he said to do. Kennedy said, no way, not taking America to war against Cuba. Kennedy just didn't like the way that the CIA operated, especially running an op on him in the first three months in office with the Bay of Pigs. Dulles assured Kennedy the whole time the U.S. forces wouldn't be necessary. Crazy. You know, they, they didn't get three planes with B-26, and then Rusk or somebody called it off. Those three sunk everything. Their transport ship and their ammo ship. I think they had two. They were called the Barbara and the Houston. And it was Operation Zapata, which happened to be what George Bush named his little oil company there in the Caribbean. They were old American T-33s. They were called T-Birds, and they, they had the straight wing with the uh, pods on the end. Korean War era for the U.S. Those T-33 shot down almost every one of those bombers. They had 16 of them. Cuba had 10. The B-26s got 7. Then they called the bombing off. Those three planes sunk both their ships. At the 11th hour, Burke was insubordinate, was screaming in Kennedy's face and he held his ground. Establishment of the corporation, the steps that were taken after the end of World War II to establish a fascist system throughout South and Central America. The creation of the National Security Act of 1947, when the CIA and Joint Chiefs of Staff were created. Certain elements of the U.S. intelligence apparatus was corrupt. They were rogues pretty much doing whatever they wanted to. He engaged openly in coups of democratic governments to place fascist governments, corrupt dictators, that they could control and power, giving American corporations pretty much unbridled power in South and Central America, enslaving the people. Most of it came from the Anderson Trust for $3.2 trillion. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, I heard that. I heard them talk. Yes. That. Yeah. Well, the point about that is what I mentioned earlier with, say, our superannuation 401ks and that. So they were exploiting everything around the world, yes. taking 50% off the top. At the world's So detriment. they gave themselves... They gave themselves 50% return off the top of it. Then they turned around the other 50% and allow the millions to become part of it. So then we, we all feel that we've got a vested interest in all this now. We don't realise that there's 50% and they've cut it down so there's 25% roughly for the masses after they've taken all their costs out. And at the end of it, we're now prepared to shed blood to maintain a very, very small part of it that makes us feel, I suppose, feel rich. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the, yeah, you know, so the Anderson I, Trust is uh, the U.S. military uh, captured the Japanese general. How they found out, I do not know, but they tortured his driver until he <laughs> revealed the hiding places of basically what was all of Japan's plunder over the last 12 years. Jewels, gold, yeah. platinum. But it, it yep. came to $3.2 trillion. It was found by Ed Lansdale. I think a, a, trillion dollars back in, a trillion dollars back in the 1950s yeah. and 60s was the equivalent to probably $30 trillion now. Oh, yeah. You know, you know that's you know, right. So, so when you put it all together, you got to say, that was a massive amount of wealth that they... Talk. Yeah, and and again when Danny was doing his talk, and he was talking about Kennedy, 
and those families, those families or that group, what they call that group, that, that they controlled a trillion dollars. Brown Brothers Harriman. A trillion dollars in 1963 was a huge, huge amount of money. So, you know, like when you look at it, Kennedy, unless he had total Congress on side, was never going to be able to match him. Because right. no? they were a too established. That's that money. Held by, well, you know, it was well, held yeah. by the investment firm. Brown Brothers Harriman, whose yep. attorneys yep. were William and Sullivan and Cromwell, which is where Alan Dulles came from. And get this, the CEO yep. of this Brown Brothers Harriman was a guy named George Herbert Walker. Is this on the mm-hmm. He founded the Union Bank of New York. His son-in-law was Prescott Bush, members That's of the wrong. firm that has a $50 million entry fee. I mean, you have to be worth fifty million dollars to be a member of this uh, yeah. group. The Duponts, and that was back, and that was back in the nineteen thirties. Right. Yeah, that's right. Right. So, so fifty million dollars back then. Yeah. To, to put that into today's money, you, you're looking at probably you've got to have probably around a billion now. Yes. You know, it, you know, it, quite that. it includes Duponts. Makers of gunpowder yep. explosive, of course. The Harriman, Averill Harriman, John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, United Fruit Corporation. This was the power elite. They were staunch enemies of anything JFK. Well, you see, see, they're able to buy. They're able. Yeah. Yeah, and through the electoral system, they're able to buy power. Yeah. Absolutely. Which gives gives them a, see they're able to buy they're able yeah yeah and through the electoral system they're able to buy power yeah absolutely which gives gives them a lot of control yeah 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 that's the crux yeah to me that probably is the group that were the ones who probably said it's okay to do that you know to this guy. And you remember yeah, well, they quietly, they quietly funded it all. Sure. Yeah, because Kennedy was an enemy. You know, there was a coup in 1934. They went to the commandant of the Marine Corps. And unfortunately for them, he wasn't a traitor. He turned him in. FDR didn't really punish him, though. I don't understand that. They must have had that's something all. on him. Yep. That's often been the trouble whereby, yeah, yeah, the average person won't hit the enemies hard enough. By the time JFK came into office, they were very powerful. Kennedy was hated viciously. Well, well, he got that way because he was standing, he was standing up to him. Yeah, he he chose Main Street over Wall Street. I guess that's a no-no. You know? <laughs> no, no, yep. you're not allowed to do that. He thought he was really the president. That's why they killed him. <laughs> Hey, have you ever? Well, I think I think there's a combination of things involved in that, you know. Yeah. And one of the things was too, you know, like you got to go back a century. You had Lincoln, you had Lincoln um, murdered, and you mm-hmm. go back before that, you had a couple of others, right? Yeah. And each time, it lets the people know that you know, no matter who you are, you can be got. There's you really no safe place. What, that's right, yes. Because yes. they even had the yeah. driver of the car in their pocket. So it was like an insurance mm-hmm. policy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, when you look at what they do, yeah, you're right, it's like an insurance policy. And, and they just let the masses quietly know, <clears throat> you know, and, and we get trapped into, you know, like got to take a side and all that instead of looking at it and going, wow, this is, we don't want to be a part of this. Yeah, I just yeah, I like I like facts. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just like facts. But when it takes yeah. six million files to explain a man in a building shooting a man in a car, you know something's wrong. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then did you ever did you ever hear of the weird coincidences between President Kennedy and Lincoln? It's amazing. No. Yeah, I could go through a few of them. I haven't written down here. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. All right, I'll just president. rattle them off. Both presidents were shot sitting on a Friday before a major holiday while seated beside their wives, neither of whom were injured. Both were in the presence of another couple, 
and in each case, that man was also wounded by the assassin. Each president in his 30s married a socially prominent 24-year-old girl who spoke French fluently. Well, in the White House, each president had a family of three children, and both of them lost a child through death. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were second children. Both were boat captains. Both were related to a U.S. Senator, Attorney General, Ambassador to Great Britain, and the Mayor of Boston. It just gets freaky, man. Each had been elected to Congress in the year 47 and were vice presidential runner-ups in the year 56. Each was elected president in 60. Before each was elected, his sister died. Both had a friend named Billy Graham and knew an Adlai Stevenson. President Kennedy had a secretary named Mrs. Lincoln, and President Lincoln had a secretary named John Kennedy. The names Lincoln and Kennedy each contain seven letters. Both were succeeded by vice presidents named Johnson, Andrew, born in 1808, Lyndon, born in 1908, both of whom had 13 letters in their names and two daughters. Both assassins had 15 letters in their names. Both shot Lincoln in a theater and fled to a warehouse, uh, you know, <coughs> the Oswald, yeah. which we know isn't true, shot Kennedy from a warehouse and fled to a theater. Both assassins were in their turn assassinated by shooters who used the Colt revolver and fired only one fatal shot. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946. Abe Lincoln was elected president in 1860. John Kennedy in 1960. Both were particularly concerned with civil rights. Both presidents were shot on a Friday. Both were shot in the head. Both were assassinated by Southerners. Both were succeeded by Southerners named Johnson. Andrew Johnson succeeded Lincoln was born in 1808 and Lyndon was born in 1908. Some of them are repeats. Yep, they said that. And that's, yep. let me see, what was your name? Good ones. Lincoln <clears throat> shot. Okay, the theater named Ford. Kennedy was shot in a car, Lincoln, made by Ford. Booth and Oswald were assassinated. And a week before Lincoln was shot, he was in Monroe, Maryland. A week before Kennedy was shot, he was with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he wasn't with Marilyn Monroe. They must have just did that to be funny because Marilyn Monroe died in 1962. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's pretty weird, isn't it? It is. You know, I, did you see that movie 13 Days? Have you ever seen it? Yeah, I think I have. Yeah, well, yeah. in that movie, when they're walking out, you know, because what's his name? Uh, General Curtis LeMay. He wanted to nuke half the world. And yeah, uh, when Kennedy what? said no, he comes charging out of the White House, or, you know, into the Oval Office saying, them damn Kennedys are going to ruin this country unless something's done. Now, you could call that the JFK assassination part one. You know, he learned quick. I mean, they screwed him over. They lied to him. They put him in a position where it almost cost nuclear war. And he stayed to his guns and he didn't do what they wanted him to do. And they hated him so much for it, it cost him his life. I mean, if you lied Can to the I ask a question then, Greg? What? Go we're ahead. Just doing, we're just doing the 60th year of his assassination. Yeah. In the US, is there much being said about it, or is it being kept very subdued, very quiet in the current political climate? It, to me, it seems unduly quiet. The air out of the room by that ridiculous book of some secret service agent that allegedly found a bullet. Ten years ago, they did the same exact thing. Sam Kinney, I think his name is. So how many bullets did they going to find? And they sucked all the air out of them. They got this uh, video uh, out now. It's uh, One Day in America, where they talk about, you know, these, these guys are in their 90s, and they're talking about, Oswald, the sixth floor. It's just ridiculous. But the people that want to go deep on it, if they really want to, they can find it. Yes, that's what I've felt. Yeah. You know, the, the Democrats have shut down any discussion on it. Yeah, because Bob's running. <laughs> and, they seem to, 
and they seem to be shutting down as much discussion on it, as many things as they can. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And and it seems that yeah, if 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 you weren't aware, you'd think nothing's happening. Yeah. No. Yeah. And yet you've got <clears throat> all these things going on around the world. Right. Where literally millions of people, young people especially, are being traumatized by the war system, which then right. makes them, as they grow older, traumatized, traumatized people, mm-hmm. and and of course they they will be very hard to ever, you know, like have a normal existence because they'll be wanting some sort of retribution for what's gone on to them. Yeah, you know and the I mean? sad the sad part is they really don't know that that's not just normal. I mean that you yeah. know the people have yeah. been bamboozled. You know that guy, that yeah. one CIA director for Reagan said, "Well, no, our disinformation campaign is successful when everything the American public believes is false." Yeah, and isn't that the truth? Isn't that the case? Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, that's what's happening. I See? just I and don't understand it. When you were talking earlier about. Trust and integrity. Right. 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 And yet, what have we got now? Oh, I know. We don't seem to have any trust in our trust from our, our people in our positions, and their integrity is very questionable. But they've earned that. They've earned that. Yeah. Oh, by, oh, by no doubt. Yeah. But they swapped that for money. Of course. If you get what I mean, they've swapped that for money. <clears throat> so, ever since probably the late 70s everything now focus around focuses around money you know that's why when 2008 crash come the pres- uh, the the people in position of power mm-hmm. weren't prepared to take on the people that caused it they found in other words you and i as a collective we wore the losses bailing them out while they went went on holidays <laughs> you know yeah. And that just seems to be what's going on, probably now since the late, the, the the later part of the 70s. Yeah, and you know, there's been a lot of talk lately about different things, and you got to say we had a chance of change that was plundered when the Soviet Union fell apart. We mm-hmm. could have gone in there and, um, on a good note, help yes. them gradually get rid of their their um corrupt practices and got rid of a few of ours and we could have been great trading partners now Uh, absolutely and instead bush was president bush won instead we like just weaponed up and got even more powerful now we're the real bosses now there's no superpower what the heck what and now all the masses (laughs) what just learn to understand that method of thinking i mean I understand that they want a safe United States, but you don't go. And I suppose it comes down to Greg, as you would be aware, as as I am. How much does one person need? You know, like how much wealth does one person need? How much energy does one oh. person need? And you've got these groups now that have hugely disproportionate amounts of wealth compared to a lot of others. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying they can't have it, but what I'm saying is, what's the ultimate, what, what's the end game, you know? Right. Yeah, what, what's the end game in this, you know? At, at what point do you go, well, oh, I've got sufficient, I'm just going to go off and say fish in the Bermudas or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, the so, JCS had a full court press on President Kennedy for war anywhere. You know, they pressed him on Cuba, I mean, from day one. And then there was Laos. And Vietnam. Vietnam was just... And you know, there's one thing that that, that no one mentions in this. So apparently, around the time of JFK getting back in, in and all through that, the Ku Klux Klan reorganized itself and was really growing big and and all that. And of course, after his death, they were starting to push their weight around. And mm-hmm. apparently Johnson Johnson basically shut it down. 
let them know that wasn't going to be the go. So you've got within your own, you know, you've got uh, that that JK, and you'd probably find a lot of the people organised and a lot of that were connected with those names you've already said, you know? Yeah, you know, I kind of feel like LBJ kind of like cloaked himself or clothed himself with the martyred president, you know, and, and actually, oh, I've, I've got, I've got, actually no, got no, things no, done. The civil rights was passed, Medicare, everything that was being held up by, on the Kennedy administration was passed. And Johnson was looked like a hero. Passed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was yeah. able to be passed after it because so many people were so shocked by it. Kennedy yeah. even he even predicted Islamic radicalism as early as 1957. Yep. If we didn't yep. have a balanced policy in the Middle East. He called the Vietnam War before it even really got going. We were there after 45 on Ho Chi Minh's side. But then they turned when France tried to reoccupy Vietnam. They were beaten by the Viet Cong and the NVA. They created the 38th parallel and tried to establish a government for South Vietnam, but it didn't work. And Kennedy called that 10 years before it happened, that we could not defeat an enemy, which is everywhere and at the same time nowhere. An enemy of the people with the support of the people. He had a great mind. Yep. I know in one, there's, I remember this one thing, I was, I can't remember which book I read it in. Might have been Jim Douglas's book, uh, Jeff Kennedy, The Unspeakable. 19, in 1961, President Kennedy was briefed on PSYOP 62, a nuclear yeah. first strike in all countries that yep. they considered red. JFK yep. walked out of the meeting in the middle of it, telling his Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, and we call ourselves the human race. Yeah. That pretty much yeah, There's going to be, now, time gap out here. So in the last couple of days, it's come out where Pine Gap out here is being used uh -huh. to di direct the um, attacks and that on Gaza, Gaza used to direct missiles and where stuff's coming from and all that, right? Really? So, of course, yep. So wow. Pine Gap gives you the ability <laughs> to cover. That's why it's so important because... Coin gap gives the US government what no other government's got is it gives them the ability from the backside of the world, so to speak, <laughs> to, to watch yeah. the top half of the world. To reach out. And no yeah. one else has got that, right? And that's starting to come out now. So I dare say there'll be protests and that over that soon. We'll start out here because there's a lot of protests and that happening with what's going on over there now. So it looks oh, like Pine Gap. Gap will be back on the radar. <laughs> uh, you know, the last time I heard about Pine Gap, it related to UFOs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that some was funny dark, stuff dark going journalists. on over there. That was dark journalists. But what it gives you yeah. is the ability to really cover the whole world with the tracking through the satellite system and and all that. And that's what got me is at the end of it, all those missiles that went into Israel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can be tracked to where they came from. All right, we know the abilities there for the US and that to to to, to track them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So yeah. So it's interesting to see how, you know, and and it, and it is too. Like um, at this point of time, when you've got what went on with JFK and and all the Dallas brothers and all them others involved. Yeah, the tentacles yeah. were deep, man. Yep, no. yep, yeah, and they have a lot of English. They have a lot of English heritage behind them. Yeah, you know, so they're not. You know, it's not just an American. It's an American English thing. Oh, absolutely. You know? Well, I, I would imagine Australians are are, are uh, also in that group too. I mean, it seems oh, yeah. like the U.S., Great Britain, and Australia uh, are like they think on a planet. Yeah. It's very same, so they must have their elite, their elite with our elite. Call in them Canada. Shot. In Canada, yeah. Yep, yep. It's, and they, yep. what they subscribe to a fascist lifestyle. 
Well, it's become that way, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's become that way where where once, you know, you, your king was sort of like he was the god. Mm-hmm. Then you take your your country, well, you know, he's become a republic, independent and, and a republic. So then it was the president was, you know, like looked up to very well mm-hmm. because of that. But now it's become where we look look at the corporation and and the corporation and the CEO, you know, like, so what they say is meant to be like God. Mm-hmm. You and I know so many of them, they're just not very good people. Yeah. Absolutely right. They just, they don't, I don't know, you know, we, they think differently than we do. Well, yeah, they think it in a harder way. Yeah, it's all about profit, which is power. Mm. You know what I mean? It's all about them yeah. they're more individualistic than, than we are no so we'll work in a in a, in a in a in a group or a collective where sort of level so there'll even be less human involvement president kennedy was the target of a covert operation by the cia alan dulles and the may and limitzer to try to force his hand to invade cuba but he stood firm and said no we're not doing that. So once he got the real deal, then he couldn't very well do what he said he'd do in the campaign by making war. As Dulles joked, he really thought he was the president. The State Department hawks that were left over from the Eisenhower administration engaged in what is called threat inflation, or making up the enemy to be much bigger and badder than they really were. <laughs> The truth is that the Soviet Union was exhausted from World War II. They lost 27 million people. Imagine that. Why is it that that's so lopsided? No other country came close to that. I think Germany might have lost 3 million, 4 million, not 27. Something was going on there. William D. Pauley. Uh, the author of the Doolittle Report back in 1954, in which he said that we had to develop a unit inside the Central Intelligence Agency that was more ruthless, effective in destroying our enemies than any activities that were undertaken by our enemy. And this is William D. Pauley. After the order was issued to stand down from Robert Kennedy, the S Force, and to stop any attempt to assassinate Castro, he organized a group of some people, several of whom were members of S Force. S Force was an assassination group formed through Howard Hughes under the urging of Richard Nixon, the one time vice president for eight years under President Eisenhower, and the result was the creation of S Force. Under the ruse of trying to assemble a group of people to go into Cuba to bring out two high level Russian military officers who would be able to tell the world that Khrushchev had lied and that he was not, in fact, disassembling the nuclear weapons. Going forward and assembling the nuclear weapon, William D. Pauley made up this entire fiction of what it is they were doing under the cover of the fiction of going in and bringing out a unit of people. The code name of this operation was Operation Tilt. On June 18th, they were there. There were a series of meetings on the 16th of June, Richard Billings was, at the time, the Miami bureau chief for Life magazine, and because Henry Luce, who was the editor of Life magazine, because he was so entangled in the efforts to overthrow Castro, Henry Luce, the owner of Life magazine, on eight separate occasions, had the likes on the cover of his Life and Time. He put on the covers of those magazines Hitler, or Franco, or Mussolini, praising fascism in Europe, and that he, he's the guy, in 1941, early 41, he had issued the editorial in Time magazine called for the new the American century in which he had explicitly called upon American people, the American people to support him in opposing the United States going to war against Germany. Alan Dulles was quoted as saying, we're fighting the wrong enemy. William D. Pauley and the others were going to be going in his yacht called the Flying Tiger. He was the guy financing 
a thing called the Flying Tigers, in which he and Henry Luce and his wife, Claire Booth Luce, were actually financing the flying of weapons over to the Kumanta in China, and that was all being paid for by the income from heroin traffic that was being brought out of the Southeastern Asian Golden Triangle into Havana under Batista. And what we're seeing happening in the summer and spring and summer of 1963, following the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis with Kennedy, having made his turn after that night of the metanoia experience that he had, when they looked into the abyss, him and Khrushchev were both repulsed by it. And he was undertaking this series of ascending steps to disassemble the nuclear weapons, to bring about detente with the Soviet Union, to basically undo it, taking a hundred years for these robber barons to move into place of bringing the United States into a position of being a hegemonic force, a hegemonic force in the world developing a military that was superior to everyone else in the world, to be able to project U.S. military power into the world at any time, and all of these major naval bases and military bases to basically be able to secure privileged access to the strategic raw materials that the major corporate owners wanted to have access to. They referred to it as markets, they wanted to have access to these markets. And they were doing this under the rubric of anti-communism. That you see these steps being taken by Kennedy throughout the period of 1963, following the October 28th successful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He starts, he continues to undertake these actions, and he had issued this order to stand down the S-Force, once Bobby had been told about it on June 5th by Walter Sheridan. He assembles this group of, of 10 anti-Castro Cubans and they undertake the secret operation called Operation Tilt. And Dick Billings had actually gone to the meetings, two of the planned meetings for this operation, along with a guy by the name of John Martino, who was a mafia lieutenant under Santos Tropicante. And he was involved in this operation. Then, on the night of June 18th, he ends up being called by Jean Martino, and it's time to go. They're ready to do this thing. So they went to William Pauley's house in Miami, and they go to his house, they get on this little bus, the bus drives them to Miami National Airport. They have this area of the Miami National Airport in the northeastern corner. This is nicknamed by all the snake eaters, as they refer to themselves, that this was called Corrosion Corner. And this is where Southern Air Transport flew out of that was, in fact, an air company, an aircraft company that was started by William D. Pauley. So they all jump on a PBY at Corrosion Corner, and the night of June 18th, getting on the plane, there's a guy by the name of William Rip Robertson on the plane, and he turns out to be the field commander for the guest force. The assassination group that was formed by Richard Nixon under Howard Hughes. And he's there in charge of the operation. Everybody loaded onto the PBY. The pilot's name was Tosh Plumley. Maybe you've heard that name in the past. Who has also confirmed these activities. Dick Billings, the man this information came from, was there to take with his photographer to take pictures and record the event of the assassins having killed Castro which was the real reason they were being dropped off. They landed the PBY and got on the Flying Tiger 2, Polly's boat. So the Flying Tiger, the yacht that belonged to William D. Polly, was a ship that they were actually going to be functioning from. They got out of the PBY, they inflate these little rubber rafts, and they paddle out to the Flying Tiger, who was anchored there. The Flying Tiger then takes them to a place called Hognose Reef, Hognose Key, a little kind of atoll that is in the Caribbean off the shore of Cuba. They spend the night there. They get up in the morning and they load up the boats. Then they go offshore again and they put the Cuban guys into this cigarette boat, two engines. It's a great big boat with two motors on it and they were loaded with long-distance, high-powered rifle. They set out to go to into the island of Cuba, and then they all get there on the ship, still 
they go back on the Flying Tiger 2 to Hognose Key and re-anchor, waiting for the guys to get back. On the bow of the Flying Tiger is mounted a 50 caliber machine gun, believe it or not, owned by William Pauley and John Martino and Rip Robertson and Dick Billings and Ruby Enders, a number of others. These other folks start getting drunk, and John Martino and he, they start throwing their fishing off the side of the boat. And this is the part that's interesting. John Martino, he starts becoming livid the drunker they get about Kennedy, what a dirty bastard he is, and how he's betrayed them. He's jumping up and down about this. And here's Dick Billing standing there with Rip Robertson. You know, with Martino jumping up and down with William D. Pauley standing there, He's calling Kennedy no good traitor, son of a bitch, blah, blah, blah. He's jumping up and down, and William Pauly turns to him and says, Don't worry, John. We're going to kill that motherfucker. And this is William D. Pauly, a CIA operative, amongst many other things. The guy was a maniac. You really need to learn about William D. Pauly and Theodore Shackley, a couple of crazy loose cannons. I mean, that was pretty coincidental that he said this in June, and then in November... Kennedy gets killed. So it's something that was in the planning, probably at the end of the missile crisis. Kennedy saved the world from nuclear war, but it cost him his life. All of his numbers from Vietnam were jacked up by then everyone betraying him. General Maxwell Taylor, a man who clipped himself to Kennedy, and a uh, brown nose to him, and Kennedy brought in and reactivated him. There's a Trojan horse, basically, according to Major John Newman. And he betrayed Kennedy every chance he got, doing his best to implement his Plan 34A over Kennedy's desire to get out of Vietnam with NSM-263. Way back in 1913, President Woodrow Wilson said in his book, The New Freedom, he said, An invisible empire has been set up in our nation above the forms of democracy, a power so organized, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete and so pervasive that some of the biggest men in the United States in the fields of commerce, manufacture, and government know they had better not speak above their breath when they speak of it. In 1936, FDR said, We must struggle against these enemies of peace, these owners of business and financial monopolies the financial speculators and the men in charge of reckless banking practices and war, war profiteering. These forces have come to consider our American government to be a mere appendage of their private business affairs, where our government is being run by the interests of organized wealth. It is as dangerous as if our government were being run by an organized mob. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united as they are today. This concentration of corporate power and private wealth is seriously impairing the effect and effectiveness of our American economic system to provide adequate employment opportunities to our people or adequate capital to smaller business. In short, this concentration of power is pairing our economy from being able to assure an adequate distribution of income and earnings above the people of our nation. It goes on to say these, pri these privileged princes of our new corporate economic dynasty, thirsting for power and private profit, as they do, would reach out to seek control over the government itself. They have indeed done this and have created a new despotism, which they have which they have wrapped in the robes of legal sanction into their service. These modern mercenaries have sought to draft our people, our labor, and our property. We now face a financial and industrial dictatorship in which the political, the, with the political quality that we once believed we had, finally, that we finally believed we achieved, we now face a financial and industrial dictatorship in which the political quality that we once believed we had finally won has now become meaningless in the face of this new degree of economic inequality. A very small group of extremely wealthy and political men 
has now successfully concentrated into their own hands almost complete control over other people's property, other people's money, other people's labor, and other people's lives. Therefore, our lives are no longer truly free. When it comes to the Kennedy assassination, the other side always comes out every 10-year anniversary with new evidence. Now they've got Secret Service agent of 88 years old, Winston, or Lawson, claiming he found a bullet. Ten years ago, the driver of the follow-up car, whose name was Sam, said the same exact story. So they just put that stuff out there for the surface skimmers. In order to get the truth for this, you need to dive deep. You need to start looking at the facts. There's no theory about it. With six million files, or more, which would seem to be excessive for a man in a building that shoots a man in a car, it's clear that you haven't gone through it if you think Oswald is the assassin. It's not uh, any kind of, with any kind of attitude, it's just it's how I feel. If one just puts in the littlest amount of investigating with an open mind, it will be pretty easy to see that he was shot from the front. End of story. But they still parade this Oswald dream whatever, nightmare, whatever you want to call it, out to the public every year and all the press falls right in line. What, was it Hitler who, if you repeat a lie enough times, people will believe it? When President Kennedy was the president at that time, 1962-3, the press did its job. It was nosy. It wanted to find things out. Just watch the movie, 13 Days. That was how it was because it was their job to keep people in line by bringing out the line, you know, putting their criminalness, their criminal minds in the public eye. But once you investigate it, it's so weak. It doesn't matter what thread you pull, it's screwed up in one way or another. And I think it was meant to be that way. It's almost like they're saying, you know, we want you to know who we are, but we don't, you know? Because they got away with it. And who knows, I don't think, you know, it's been so many years, but I don't know, the longer I live, the, the less free speech I see. You know, and then you get branded. What the heck is with that? You know, they attack the person because they can't attack them, they can't fight back with facts because they don't have any. And who would trust someone who they know lied to them for 60 years. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. There's really not much we can do about it. Just try to keep our heads down. But there's no way to live. One thing I love about America is we have free speech in all the West, England, Australia. We have, you know, we still have freedom of speech. But it seems like they're curtailing a lot of it because there's things you can't say or you'll get hooked. That sounds to me like something not many people probably think about is the enormous amount of pressure that was being put to JFK from the Joint Chiefs. Limnitzer and LeMay were often insubordinate and actually talked about pushing them to the side. They could have started World War III. They viewed World War III just as another bombing run from World War II. They didn't know about the lasting effects of radiation. But JFK did. He was a man of his times. And then what is that story? Is it honestly to blame an innocent man for the deed when they know damn well he was killed in a crossfire? I mean, the Pledge of Allegiance is something that I took with pride. You know, I was proud to be an American. But that whole thing took the flag, threw it in the mud, and stepped on it. And it's heartbreaking, because we didn't just lose a president. We lost a way of life that we could have had with world peace. However, unfortunately, corruption runs far too deep. Politicians are bought off. Criminals are looked at like movie stars, you know, it's maybe not so much today, but, it, it, you know, in the 60s and 70s they were. 
It astounds me, really. Robert Kennedy wasn't looking to make a name for himself. He looked around and saw corruption everywhere and went to war with it. With his brother as president. One fact that not many people think about is the way that JFK was treated by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They were constantly in his face at a full court press for war, anywhere. They were drunk with power. Started out with Laos, Cuba, was in Vietnam, Berlin. It was just uh, them trying to push JFK aside. They thought they could push him around. And they were wrong. He stood his ground and stuck to his guns against 99.9% .9 of the rest of the government, it seems. Even the Senate, his own Democratic Party, was down on him. They thought that we should invade. If we would have, our invasion force would have been vaporized. And then you can pretty much guess what happens from there. JFK avoided that. We got to live still to this day. We're still trying to find a way. And if good people overcome corruption, it will someday. I hope so. They thought he was showing weakness, and I guess he thought that was hilarious. Why should America ever have a feeling of weakness? It's ridiculous.